continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. And last month, I journeyed to Hyde Park here in New York State to visit once again the magnificent Franklin D. Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum and to attend the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute's bestowal of its prestigious Four Freedoms Awards. This year's awards mark the 70th anniversary of FDR's famous Four Freedoms speech, in which the president noted first that there is nothing mysterious about the foundations of a healthy and strong democracy. The basic things expected by our people of their political and economic systems are simple, FDR said in 1941, listing equality of opportunity for youth and for others, jobs for those who can work, security for those who need it, the ending of special privilege for the few, the preservation of civil liberties for all, the enjoyment of the fruits of scientific progress in a wider and constantly rising standard of living. Specifically, the president continued, we should bring more citizens under the coverage of old age pensions and unemployment insurance. We should widen the opportunities for adequate medical care. We should plan a better system by which persons deserving or needing gainful employment may obtain it. And to achieve these objectives, the president called for personal sacrifice, which means the payment of more money in taxes. That was 70 years ago, mind you. Then FDR went on, to summon the moral strength of our entire nation in announcing as America's goal a world founded upon four essential human freedoms. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. The fourth is freedom from fear, which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction of armaments to such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. Today my guest is the founder, as well as the president and chair emeritus of the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute that has done so much to remind Americans of FDR's Four Freedoms legacy. And now, Ambassador William J. Vanden Heuvel 
crowns his long career as diplomat, historian, attorney, assistant and counsel to and confidant of Bobby Kennedy, of General Wild Bill Donovan, founder of World War II's OSS, the precursor of the CIA, of American Civil Liberties Union founder Roger Baldwin, of New York Governor Averill Harriman, and of so many, many other American leaders. He now crowns this illustrious career with his role as the devoted chair of the soon-to-be-completed Louis J. Kahn-designed Franklin D. Roosevelt Four Freedoms Park, so appropriately located here in New York on Roosevelt Island, right off from the United Nations. Now, last summer, the New Yorker's Pulitzer Prize-winning architecture critic Paul Goldberger went with my guest and Sally Menard, the intrepid president of the FDR Four Freedoms Park Corporation, to see their and Louis Kahn's handiwork. And perhaps I was most impressed with Bill Vanden Heuvel's reported comment that this is like a religious experience. This is really a temple of freedom. And today I would begin by asking the ambassador, how so? Why so? The Louis Kahn, uh, Richard, let me say, first of all, how pleased I am to be here with you, the dean of broadcasters and whose personal archive is the best history of the last <laughs> 60 years that anyone could look for. Thanks, Bill. But uh, Louis Kahn, when he designed it uh, in 1973, 74, this was his last work and he died shortly afterward. He is known for the extraordinary spirituality of the things that he has created. And Paul Goldberger and I, as we stood out on the room at the very tip of the island, that is the room of the Four Freedoms, and you looked out at the sea, and you looked out at the United Nations that Roosevelt had done so much to found, and you read the words of the Four Freedoms, freedom of speech and expression, freedom to worship as one should, wants to worship, freedom from want, freedom from fear. You just had the sense that if every American could come to that island and walk through that park and stand in that place and see that site, that you would be reminded of the great vision of this country. Roosevelt gave that speech in January 1941. We weren't yet in the war. The war had begun. But he knew what the cost of World War II was going to be, the devastation of countries and of cities and of resources, the terrible death of 67 million people in a, in a war. And he said the one thing we owe to everyone out of this is to create a different world. Not the world of the totalitarian leaders, not the world of Winston Churchill, which was an imperial world, but the world of America, the world of a vision of freedom where people could come, start their lives, be who they are, speak what they want to say, and have a democratic government that they can influence. So that speech, I think, has survived because it was so important in terms of creating the vision of the world and the country that we want America to be. Do you think that we today uh, represent uh, a people who understand and embrace that almost religious quality of vision? I hope so. I mean, certainly there's a great, still a great feeling in America of commitment to what basically are these freedoms. They're incorporated in the Charter of the United Nations. They're in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I think America, with all the frailties, with all the faults, with all the failures, is still the greatest protector and defender of the concept of democracy. Democracy is a very difficult government to organize. As Winston Churchill said, it's the most difficult of all forms of government, except for all the rest. So Americans have been true to the faith. I see that there's a lot of dangers today that uh, are strangely reflections from the Roosevelt era. The what same, do you mean? The same kind of forces that he had to confront. Take, for example, the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has made, in my judgment, a series of decisions that have had a very powerful political influence and have been decided almost on political grounds not least of which is the Citizens United case, which gives corporations the persona of the 14th Amendment protections 
and permits the unlimited contribution of money by the corporate interests in America to democracy. Now, corporations obviously should be heard and participate in American democracy. They're crucial to it in job creation. But the, that kind of, of money is, I think, devastating in terms of what America's larger interests should be. And, you know, here we are involved in endless war. We've been now in Afghanistan for 10 years and more. We're struggling to come out of Iraq. We want to stay and the Iraqis don't want us to stay. And I think it's a time where we have to look into our own soul and see the country we want to be. You and I are essentially products of the Depression. We saw our fathers unemployed. We saw our houses subject to possible mortgage foreclosures. We still have a feeling for what was devastating America in those days. But t today, those, the reason America is different, it seems to me today, is because Roosevelt and the New Deal brought in a network of things that saved us, social security, unemployment insurance, the beginnings of medical concern. The government had a different role, not to interfere in our lives, but to make our lives better and to save us from the devastating consequences of economic recession and depression. Well, we've, I think, sort of lost our way. I mean, when President Bush began the war in Afghanistan and at the same time reduced taxes, that's not right. America should pay for its wars. If we're going to go to war, we should pay for them. That's not the burden we want to leave to our children. So. Uh, we're confronting a lot of our financial problems today, but we should do it in the spirit, it seems to me, of the democracy that, that Roosevelt and Lincoln and Washington and Theodore Roosevelt spoke about and fought for. But, Mr. Ambassador, what, what happened? The, the, that cry comes so naturally to me. As a historian, I wrote back in the 50s about the permanent New Deal revolution the permanent Roosevelt Revolution. What happened to it? You say you're reminded so much of Roosevelt's battle with the Supreme Court. Today, yeah. we're dealing with the same problems, only seemingly dealing with them very differently. Yeah, I, what happened? Well, Roosevelt was prepared to fight. These aren't battles that uh, can be won by being quiet and standing on the sidelines. Now, for a president to confront the Supreme Court is a very, very dangerous thing, and Roosevelt paid a high political price for it. But had he not done it, Social Security would have been ruled unconstitutional by the same court that had ruled the Railway Act unconstitutional, the agricultural. He saved the New Deal by challenging the court. And I think we're now in a, we now are in a process of stalemate. We're no longer a majority democracy. You cannot pass anything in the Senate of the United States without 60 votes. That's, that's an amendment to the Constitution that nobody ever voted on or passed. But that is, in fact, the case, so that the majority of senators who want to exercise their point of view can't do it because you can't break that filibuster routine. I think we should do it. I think we should challenge them. I think we should challenge that rule and let the filibuster thing see whether it can survive. In the House of Representatives now, you have a, a political dynamic that is determined to destroy the president. Well, it's very hard for democracy to work in that kind of context. And uh, we're going to have a, an election, and perhaps this will clear the air. But it's a, it's a dangerous and tricky time for American democracy. You say perhaps it will clear the air, the election of November 2012. Yeah. Which I mean, way? Well, one way or the other, it could, I mean, you're going, to have a, you're going to have a president, maybe you'll have a Congress of the same party, or maybe you'll have a Congress that's prepared to work with whoever is elected president. That's what we've had. I mean, the fight in Washington is always intense, and the interests and special interests are always in great conflict. But there's always been a larger concern that we are a country, that we're a nation, that we are Americans and that we can find a way together by compromise and understanding each other's point of view. Now the civility of government is almost absent, and the conflict of government is so intense and so personal that the things that have to be done to re preserve America as, the, uh, as our great nation and our great vision of our country, I'm afraid, are, are being pushed aside. 
And the Four Freedoms Park is designed to remind Americans of what we can be and what we should be. And I think that in addition to being an extraordinary contribution to the city of New York as a beautiful artistic creation. There's no other work by Louis Kahn in New York, and, and, and the, he has a universal audience of people who will come just to see that. And you'll see, I think, open space preserved, the greatest beautiful site in New York preserved. And you'll see the very simple words of the Four Freedoms, and we are digitizing the park. What do you mean? So that as you go through it with your phone, uh -huh. you'll be able to have the history of the Roosevelt era from the beginning of the deep, Great Depression, from his history as governor of New York, right through to Second World War and to his death. This is a pioneering experiment, and I think it's going to change the use of public space. It's, so I think the visitors who come there and the school children who come there, people from all over the world, you'll be able to get the Roosevelt history at your fingertips and available to you. You can, also, sit quiet, you can sit quietly and just look at the trees, but you'll have the other part available to you. This is an extension of your long, long, long time involvement with things Rooseveltian right. up at Hyde Park. Right. And you, I know, invested so much of your own resources up there. But Richard, the, I think you'll understand when I say I'm not a hagiographer. I'm not someone who's interested in making Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt saints. I'm interested in reminding Americans that the America that they envisioned and that they helped to create is the America that I embrace and I hope Americans will embrace. An America that we're not, Roosevelt used to say, I, I don't care how rich people get, but I do care how poor people get. And you want a government that's going to say, I want to be judged by not how much I do for those who have much. I want to do, have a government that's judged by those helping those who have need. A government that stood up to Hitler from the very beginning and understood the threat of tyranny at a, at a time in the 30s when democracy was under assault and many people thought that the totalitarians were going to win. Roosevelt never doubted that, that fight. So, you know, when I went to see Ronald Reagan once about getting money for the Roosevelt Memorial in Washington, the first thing he said to me was, I voted four times for Franklin Roosevelt he was the greatest president in the 20th century. He was a patron himself, Ronald Reagan, of the New Deal. He took exception to the great society of Lyndon Johnson. But to his dying day, he was faithful to what Roosevelt had tried to do in the country. I think what we're witnessing now is the escalation of a political movement that would like to undo the New Deal, that would like to privatize Social Security and in the process undermine it that would like to prevent the possibility of having a medical insurance plan that truly helps everybody in our country. And, uh, and those forces are well financed. They've always been there, by the way. Roosevelt, as you know, had plenty of enemies. People. That old cartoon in New Yorker, <laughs> the fat cats saying, let's yeah. go down to the Translux and hiss Roosevelt. And hiss Roosevelt. But one thing Roosevelt also had that was wonderful was the sense of humor. You know, that when you, you get a sense that he was he, uh, joyful in the White House, that he, he exercised the power of the presidency with skill, but also because he enjoyed, he had a vision of himself and of the country, and he was going to be per, t grateful for the opportunity to fill them out. So uh, we've had wonderful people president since Franklin Roosevelt, certainly, but as Bill Luchtenberg has written, all of those presidents are in the shadow of Roosevelt in terms of what they accomplished for America. And the, re the revolution of, uh, of the New Deal and the revolution that came about in the world through the Second World War are very much the legacy of our present generations. FDR had the support of the people who were so hard pressed. Right. He was elected by them, he spoke for them, he acted for them. The question that I keep asking my guests, and I have no adequate answer as yet, is where is the voice of those people who are hurting today? Why are they not at the barricades? Is the safety net really still so strong? It is in many ways. You still have, you know, when Roosevelt came to office, the most impoverished sector of our population were the senior citizens. 
They couldn't get jobs. There was no social security. There was no welfare of organized in any way. They lived with their children or they lived in poor houses, which I used to see in Rochester, New York when I grew up. That safety net, unemployment insurance, the social security system, now medical assistance, has made life at least tolerable for those who have gone through the anguish of losing their jobs or losing their homes. And that's a terrible experience. And I'm surprised that Washington, the President of the Congress, don't identify more with what that means in terms of the anguish that families have to go through. But they'll come to the barricades when the unemployment compensation fades, if the jobs aren't becoming available. Uh, and uh, as they came to the barricades when, before Roosevelt was elected president, they were marching in the streets. I mean, the concern in the country in 1933 was whether there was going to be revolution in the streets. We don't know that as we don't people know that. today. We don't know that. I talk to my students about that, and I draw a blank. Yeah. <laughs> it's incomprehensible. Yeah. Even the story and the pictures of the bonus marchers. Yes. Imagine. And the pictures of General MacArthur as chief of staff crushing the veterans who had come right. pleading for help from the Congress. No, it's... Uh, but today... The Rooseveltian structure of the country, I think, is still strong enough to hold us all together. But, you know, there are, there are things to be concerned about. The special interests, the, the co-opting of the Congress, the role of money and greed in our society. Uh, these are things that have to be brought under management. You're beginning to see it in this young people. You know, I have a 90-year-old, 94-year-old friend who was the French ambassador to the UN when I was. He's now 94. And last September, a great hero of the resistance, one of the leaders of the French diplomatic world, uh, he, he sat down and wrote an essay, 4,000-word essay, he called it, Ennie vous why aren't we all angry? That sold five million copies in Europe between September and December to give you a sense that there is a lot of feeling out there that is finding expression. And he was here recently, and I went up to Columbia University with him, and he spoke to the students, 94 years old, just as strong and buoyant. As he got a standing ovation when he said, you've got to understand, you've got to be indignant. You've got to be angry with what's happening. Then you've got to have a program. Then you've got to believe in something. And then you've got to work to execute it. And that's what the challenge is. That's what I hope when people go to the Four Freedoms, you say a temple of freedom, yeah. I hope people will sit there, remember how fortunate we are to be Americans, but what our responsibility is to keep the legacy of the past vibrant and true. It seems to me from what I've seen and what I have read of what you have created there, that it will do just that. I think so. And therefore that comment about religious experience rang so true. In just the minute or so we have left, mm -hmm. do you think the Occupy Wall Street event happening that's going on as we tape this yeah. program indicates a movement toward the barricades. It indicates what we've seen in the recent Berlin elections, in the French elections, in the Polish elections, and in, in America, that there's a considerable percentage of people who are losing confidence in government. And they are trying to express it by saying, where, where are we represented? We're the 99% of the country that, as opposed to the 1% that controls 70% of the wealth of the nation. How do we find our way to express ourselves? How are our interests pursued? And I think there's a frustration, an anger, uh, and I think the movement that what we're witnessing as we tape this program, what we're witnessing in many cities around the country, is a growing expression of that. Americans don't demonstrate easily. They don't riot. And they don't, you know, even in Iraq, the demonstrations were very orderly, although there were hundreds of thousands of people. I think it's possible that unless the government begins to be more responsive to the needs of the people, that uh, that movement will increase in strength. Somebody would say from your lips to God's ears, <laughs> thanks, Mr. Ambassador, for Thank joining me today. Thank you, Richard. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit the Open Mind website 
at 13.org slash open mind to reprise this program online right now or to draw upon our archive of 1,500 or so other open mind and related programs. That's 13.org slash open mind. From carvings on walls to towering sculptures, each generation of humankind leaves glimpses of its experiences, its values for the generations to follow. The great leaders of our first two centuries have been honored with monuments. In our own era, there is one whose life and work have shaped the experiences of the country and the world, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. When a statue was proposed for London, five shilling subscriptions were opened one morning. By that night, the goal was oversubscribed. The statue now stands in Grosvenor Square. His was a dramatic presence. His voice stirred millions. This generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. Roosevelt's vision was one of community. The renaming of Welfare Island for him is one form of tribute. As part of the planning of the island, the southern tip was designated as a site for a memorial to Roosevelt. The person selected to design it was Louis Kahn, the internationally acclaimed architect. One aspect of the Roosevelt philosophy seemed especially powerful to Kahn. His conviction that any problem between individuals or nations could be solved by their sitting together to discuss things peaceably as around the family dining room table. Kahn's memorial to Roosevelt is perhaps an architectural interpretation of this philosophy. It's a room, a place where people can sit alone or together to meditate or hold a concert or a poetry reading. It honors the man and his belief in the community of humankind. Throughout the memorial will be carved notable quotations from Roosevelt's speeches and writings to remind visitors of the moments of his life which shaped the destiny of the country and of the world. To the west, the buildings of the United Nations stand prominent in the spectacular view of the Manhattan skyline. It is especially appropriate that his memorial be here in New York. This is the state of his birth and of his early political career as governor and of his permanent home. Roosevelt's last speech offers us a challenge. Today, he said, we are faced with the preeminent fact that if civilization is to survive, we must cultivate the science of human relationships, the ability of all peoples of all kinds to live together and work together in the same world at peace.